Hello, I'm Alexander Mitukevich, and I'm in Boston today with Professor and Nobel Laureate Robert Solo to talk about why inequality is a critical issue for economic growth. To start, Professor Solo, income inequality in the United States has returned to levels last seen in the 1920s. How does income inequality, or more generally economic inequality, affect growth? Well, income inequality affects economic growth both from the production and supply side and from the demand side, in a way. On the one side, serious inequality of the kind that we now have and hadn't had for a while uh, eliminates from economic life a lot of human resources. People at the bottom of the income distribution don't get the education, don't get the access to opportunity that others get, and we lose their talents and resources. And human capital, uh, innovative human capital, is the basic source of economic growth. And to, to lose a large fraction of that by holding them uh, far below the standards that the society can really afford is a, big, is a big loss. On the other hand, it's also true that increasing inequality tends to hollow out the income distribution. We lose the solid middle class jobs and the steady middle class incomes which provide uh, a reliable flow of consumer demand and that keeps industry going and innovating and trying to generate increases in productivity to meet that demand. So uh, any way you look at it, uh, a highly unequal society is not exploiting its full potential for growth. I want to say something more about this. The standard narrative that we Americans have is that, well, Growth depends on the innovative capacity of the American people, which it does. And the only way to take advantage of this is to have untrammeled free markets, no regulation, uh, as little taxation as possible, uh, keep the government at ground level as far as possible. That's a story, and it's a story that is very widely told and bought. And over the years, as I've looked for the evidence behind this story, I found it to be flimsy, and maybe at best flimsy. Sometimes there's not much evidence there at all. And my hope for the Washington Center is that it will ask that question seriously. How can we trace in the history and data for the US and for other countries as well, the causal relationships between inequality and growth, uh, and not settle for what may turn out, after all, to be a fairy tale. So to go on that, why is it important to have a center like the Washington Center for Equitable Growth in DC? Uh, I think it's a it's very important to have an institution like the Washington Center in Washington and in touch with the government, the federal government, and policy. Uh, I have spent almost all of my life in, in university, one university, uh, and most of the really good I ideas about economic analysis, about understanding the way our economy works, come from hard research done mostly in universities by academic economists who do research because that's the way they make their living and that's the way they get ahead. Much of that research uh, is written in what for real people is gobbledygook. Uh, it's, it's mathematical, it's statistical, it's in Greek letters a lot of the time, 
And it's abstract because the people are trying to think about basic theoretical issues. Somehow, there has to be a way of translating the good ideas. They're not all good ideas. Some of them are interesting and fancy. Some of them are uninteresting and fancy. And, and, but some of them are good ideas, and they have practical content. And there has to be a way of translating good stuff from the academy into possibilities for policy, for legislation, or for administrative policy. Uh, not finished policy. You don't expect that. But what you want is, here is, here's a piece of research, and it means something. And look, what it means is that you might be able to improve the growth prospects of the American economy if you could change thus and such in the economy. And now uh, it's up to people whose business is formulating policy to see how to make that real. And so I think of the Washington Center for, Washington Center for Equitable Growth as a, uh, an institution which will bring good academic research into a place where it can be transformed, the best of it can be transformed into practical policy ideas and centered on what seems to me to be an important, very important question for our time, how to maintain a growing economy in such a way that it produces for everybody, that it, it produces, uh, it includes everyone and generates an equitable uh, distribution of income and wealth and privileges. Why would you say that equitable growth is an important issue? Well, because growth is important. We, uh, we need, uh, incomes have stagnated, median incomes have stagnated in the U.S. for some decades now, and we could use uh, some steady growth at a decent rate. Equity is an important issue for reasons that we've already talked about, that you, an, a highly unequal society is not a place you really want to, to live. So here are two very important things. And the standard story says that in order to have one, you can't have the other. The standard story is that a rapidly growing economy has to be a jungle, has to be a free-for-all, and, and the outcome of that is likely to be extremes of, of wealth uh, on the part of the successful and failure and poverty on the part of the unsuccessful. Uh, I don't think that that standard story has a lot of backing, or any backing, really. And so we want the, the reason why the center focuses on equitable growth is that we want to find ways of replacing that fairly flimsy story with a set of practical policies that will enable the American economy and the American society to combine a satisfactory rate of growth and an equitable distribution of the benefits of growth. Do you think um, we, as a democratic society, have the ability to promote equitable growth? Do I think that we, as an equitable, as a democratic society, have the capacity? Yes. And in fact, only a democratic society is likely to want to do this. Uh, a, higher, a highly hierarchical society, an oligarchical society, is not much interested in spreading the goods around. Uh, history is full of societies that have done very well for an elite and, and not very well at all for uh, the people at the bottom who are doing the, the heavy lifting. Uh, one of the dangers, 
I didn't mention this before, but one of the dangers of extreme inequality in a society is that it's damaging to democracy itself. When you have a highly unequal society, you, you have the, the spectacle of money buying government. And uh, I could think that we have that sometimes uh, in Washington today. And, and uh, so both for the health of democracy per se itself, for democratic government, and for having the kind of democratic society that one would really like to live in, uh, it's important to find ways of, of having patterning economic growth so that it provides opportunities and, and incomes in an equitable way for all of the population. So I want to go back to um, when you were talking about there's a flimsy argument for that we can't have both. Can you go a little bit more into that and why is this a flimsy argument or what evidence, what, why is there such little evidence or could you go into that a little bit well, more? Why, why is the argument that the only successful growth policy is one of untrammeled, unregulated, uh, catch-as-catch-can uh, economics. The usual argument is that entrepreneurs, the people who innovate in the economy, run a risk, as indeed they do. Uh, they take a chance, both with their lives, their time, and with <clears throat> often with their own uh, uh, incomes in an enterprise which may work out for them and, uh, and may not. The question is, how big does the, how big and how extreme does the reward have to be to elicit innovative, progressive economic activity from the population? The, there's not now much study of that that I know of. There used to be a lot more. The typical finding always was that the, the class of innovative entrepreneurs worked more out of inner drive than out of anything else. Of course, you want, you, you need a reward for risking your time and your wealth in an enterprise. But you don't need, uh, uh, well, let me back up and, and put it this way. Ordinary people often ask themselves, if you already have uh, uh, $39 million, why do you want the 40th uh, million dollars? And there's a lot of evidence, or there used to be a lot of evidence, that uh, the entrepreneurial personality, the, you know, the person who, who, who did innovation, of course wanted to be rewarded, but was mostly, mostly pushing from some inner force that says, I want to do this. I want to succeed. And we have gone, we are told these days, that uh, if you uh, increase the highest marginal rate of income tax by a percent or two or three, you're going to turn off the Thomas Edison of the future. And there is no evidence that that's the, the case. The Thomas Edison of the future, if there is one, is going to do that work whether the marginal tax rate is 38% or 44%. And, and uh, we need to uh, uh, take account of that. Or to, to take another uh, example, we have stopped thinking about using the tax system to provide incentives for innovation and investment, for the kind of investment 
that goes along or has to go along with innovation. And I think that uh, we need more study to find what are the effects. Is, is the corporation income tax a good tax in the sense that it provides the right incentives for corporations given the amount of revenue that it uh, collects? Could we, decide, could we design a better tax system from that point of view? There are all kinds of questions like that that are never asked these days, but certainly never asked in Washington. And, and we need to begin to ask them. People in universities are probably asking them all the time. They're even setting exam questions with uh, uh, things like that. And by going after this, I think we, can, we have a good chance, an excellent chance, of finding innovative policy devices which will do the trick that we're after. So you have both worked in academia and in the policy world. Um, could you comment on kind of the bridge between the two worlds and just your experience? How do these two worlds communicate with one another, if at all? Well, my experience is, well, I was going to say it was fairly narrow. It's only moderately narrow, not excessively narrow. First of all, the, in my time, the, in the Kennedy administration, the Council of Economic Advisors was made up of, of fairly eminent academic people. Uh, and, and it was simultaneously in touch with the university world and, of course, with the uh, president and the president's uh, office. These days, that, that connection doesn't seem to be made so well. And instead, what connection there is comes from institutions in Washington that sometimes employ or subsidize, finance, academic research, sometimes do research uh, on their own. And, and since they're in Washington, they're more alert to what are the needs for policy, what are the opportunities for policy, who are the key players in, uh, in the making of policy, and they're better able to do that. There is no such agency now aiming primarily at the key question of equitable growth. And that's, the, that's what we're trying to create here. What is one way we could promote equitable growth? I would be inclined, although remember, our goal here is to do the research that will give better answers to this question. So, but if I, were, if I were simply required to speculate, I would say that I think I would be looking in two directions. First, I think that we tend to underplay, by we I mean the community interested in economic policy, both in government and outside of government. I think we tend to underplay the importance of short-run prosperity in generating the conditions for long-run economic growth. To take a simple example, we now have a, a very large volume of long-term unemployment, people who have been unemployed for six months or a year or more. We treat that generally as a problem in itself. I think there is also a connection to the long-run growth of the economy in the sense that long periods of unemployment let people's skills atrophy, let their motivations atrophy, detach them from the labor market generally, and, and cost something in terms of future uh, output. So one, one thing I would want to 
understand better is what is the relationship between the, the, the short run condition of the economy and its potential for long term, uh, long term growth. If, as I think there is, as I suspect, this needs research, if, as I suspect, there is a connection, then there is a much stronger reason for uh, aiming to reduce the volume of long-term unemployment and the volume of unemployment uh, generally. The second uh, place I would look is to rethink the, our system of taxes and transfers, keeping in mind that it has a number of goals. One goal is, re, is the redistribution of income to some extent, but the other is the provision of incentives for investment and innovation, including investment in human capital, in human skills, and so on. And I think that we should be rethinking all those uh, tax subsidy programs with equitable growth in mind. Why should policymakers care about equitable growth? Policymakers should care about equitable growth because policymakers should care about the kind of society that they're helping to create. And it seems to me that anyone who thinks seriously about it will say <clears throat> that a society that if, if you had two societies growing at the same rate, one of them generating extreme inequality and the other spreading its benefits more equitably around the population, which would you prefer to live in, sir or madam? Uh, everyone would give the same answer, or nearly everyone would give the same answer. So policymakers should be trying to... Uh, 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 to create that better kind of society. If you, if you show them two, two societies which have exactly the same degree of inequality, but one of them is stagnant and the other is growing, and ask them which they would prefer, it's obvious which they would prefer. And so the, the equitable growth ought to be the, the goal of anyone concerned with economic policy. I, and I, I think the reason it doesn't always occupy the center stage is this, this standard narrative that there's a trade-off between growth and equity. That if you want more growth, you've got to accept less equity as the price of more growth. And I don't think the evidence for that is very good at all. And an obj important object of research is to, is to rethink that narrative and discover, is there such a trade-off? If there isn't, fine. If there is, are there ways of getting around it? Are there policies that enable you to have growth with equity or equity with growth. In an interview you, you did a couple years ago, you mentioned that growth theory was the topic to study in the 1950s. In your opinion, what is the topic to study in 2013? Well, I think the topic to study in 2013 is growth with equity. Uh, uh, when I began to be interested in the theory of economic growth was in the years just after the Second World War, and, and uh, it was a whole part of the world was emerging from darkness, and it was really important to think about how, just how to get growth per se. Uh, since then, that's, that's 60, more, 60 plus years ago, uh, there's been a lot of, of growth, uh, more in some places than in others. And the urgency to get an extra dollar of real GDP is not as great compared 
with the urgency of getting a more, a less unequal society. So I, I really do think that the, this question of equitable growth is certainly one of the, if not the central issue, economic issue of our time. It, I would match it up only with the problem of uh, uh, sustaining something closer to full employment. And I think, and that's what encourages me, that those two problems are positively connected with one another. I have my bachelor's degree in economics and I hope to return to graduate school in a couple of years and get my PhD in economics. So as we wrap up our conversation, um, what advice do you have to new economists that are just beginning their careers? Ah, uh, well, uh, I have some interest in this since uh, one of my grandchildren is currently a PhD student in, uh, in economics, and another of my grandchildren is a sophomore in college, but is thinking of doing economics and eventually going to graduate school. And uh, I would, one piece of advice I have is, uh, first of all, do the technique, do the technical stuff and get it out of the way so you don't have to worry about it. Learn whatever mathematics you have to learn. Learn the statistics you have to learn. And, and just get it done so it's not, it's not something you think about every day. It, you've, already, you've already done that. Been there, done that. The second thing, I think, is to choose problems to be interested in wisely. And I think that it's very important to work and be interested in and work on problems which are economically interesting and difficult, but have, have a real world urgency about them. So uh, I would think that focusing on the labor market would be a very useful, would be a kind of interesting thing for a person now. Uh, and, and I would also look for a graduate school and in that graduate school for a couple teachers who A, like students, not all of them do, unfortunately, uh, and, and B, are themselves working on problems which are both interesting and socially important, and then latch on to those teachers and learn from them. Thank you so much, Professor Solo, for taking the time to talk to me this morning, and um, it's just a true honor to meet you. And Well, thank you. It's been, it's been fun. <laughs>